Um, so this this being the last of the this particular run of webinars, I'd just like to very briefly give you a, a sort of introduction or overview of what we've uh, done so far. So we've had eight seminars altogether. We started looking at just what the Bible is. We looked at um, you know the books of the Bible, the Old and New Testament. We had a session on the um, you know the manuscripts and Greek and Hebrew and what translations there are. And then we looked at various study tools. But then we started to move into what the Bible really teaches. So, for example, um, God's plan and purpose for the earth and for us and for mankind. We also looked at the idea of life and death. And also in this webinar and previous webinar, we started to look at God's promises. So part one, and this is part two. So in a sense, I like to think of maybe the first half of the seminar as kind of being theory you know, in principle, all very interesting. This is what the Bible teaches. But those latter um, webinars, you can really think of as being in practice. So this isn't just theory. The Bible is extremely interesting, fascinating book, lots of history. But really, it's also personal. There's a message there for each and every one of us. God has a plan and purpose for mankind, and he actively wants us to be part of that. We looked last week at some of the promises that God has made to people, and we'll continue that today by looking at the promises he's made to the Jewish people. And that's when things start to become actually quite personal and quite relevant to us living in this, this latter day, because these things affect us, and we are going to be affected by them, I think, very, very soon. So let's just sort of recap on what we looked at last week, and then we'll pick the story up from there. So we looked at, first of all, the promises to Adam, also Adam and Eve. We probably didn't look too much at the promises to Noah, but Noah also had promises to him, some very important promises, not just to him, but also to his family. He was married, had a wife, he had three sons, and they had wives. So there was eight people in the ark altogether. But then we looked at the promises to, to Abraham. And Abraham is a, a very important figure in the Old Testament. He showed faith. He was actually probably almost unique in his generation in that he showed faith, and he did everything that God wanted. But actually, again, that isn't the theory, because the New Testament is full of references to Abraham. And just as Abraham showed faith and God blessed him, those same promises are given to us. And if we show like faith that Abraham did, then we also can inherit the same promises. And we also looked at the promises to, to David and to, to the kings of Israel. And we're going to look tonight at promises to, to Israel. But think of this, think of the way that God works as being a, a kind of progression, an expansion down through many centuries. First of all, he started with Adam, just one person. Then he moved to Adam and Eve. So that was a couple. Then he moved to a family. So Noah and his sons, eight people all together. Then he moved to an extended family, so Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So now a whole sequence of families down through the ages. Then he made promises to, to the, the Jewish people, to Israel, and that's now an entire nation, which we'll look at tonight. And through the faith of Abraham and through understanding all of those promises together, all nations will be blessed. And so Israel is referred to in scripture as being the first fruits of the nation. It's one nation as an initial harvest, and then all nations will be blessed through those same promises that we've looked at. So the way that God works really is through a progression or a cycle of increasing promises to different people. First an individual, then a couple, then a family, then a sequence of families, then a whole nation. And so finally, all nations will be blessed through Abraham, and so on. So let's just remind ourselves a little bit of history. While this might look like history, it's actually really relevant because those same promises are still active down through thousands of years. And by understanding them, it helps us to understand what God wants from us in this day and age, and also how he will reward us if we are faithful. So Abraham lived about you know 3,900 years ago, he married, um, his wife was Sarah, who be, or Sarai, who became Sarah. So Abraham and Sarah had two sons, Ishmael, who was kind of their way of thinking they would fulfill God's promises. 
but the child of blessing was Isaac. So Abraham and Rebekah gave birth to Isaac, and it was through him that the promises came. There was actually a second, there was Isaac um, married Rachel and Leah, and also the two concubines that he was with. And in turn, they had the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's Joseph and Benjamin, and then Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, and then also through the concubines, Dan and Naphtali, and Gad and Asher. So they are known as the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's name was Jacob, but he was renamed Israel when he fought with the angel and succeeded. So the 12 tribes of Israel, as they're commonly referred to, are from, from Jacob. Let's just think about that in a little bit more detail. We've seen last week in detail about the promises to Abraham and just how important they are to us in this day and age. But when Abraham died, those same promises were repeated again to Isaac. So you can look up the verse there, but in Genesis 26, and the Lord appeared unto him, that's Isaac, and said, I will be with thee and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed. I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. So the promises to Abraham were repeated on a number of occasions. They were then repeated to Isaac. And whenever in scripture something is repeated, it means it's especially important. God's sort of doubling up the message to make sure that we understand it. So those same promises to Abraham that we looked at, at last week were extended to Isaac because he was the next generation. And the people at the time understood that those promises were going down the generation to Isaac. So Isaac also was very, very faithful. He also had a similar faith to Abraham. He also obeyed God and did what God wanted. And that's why those promises were extended to him. But his son in turn was Jacob, who was renamed Israel. And again, those promises were repeated that Jacob now received those blessings when Abraham had passed off the scene and when Isaac had passed off the scene. So, for example, here in Genesis 28, and behold, the Lord said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereupon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. So those same promises were given to Abraham, they were repeated to Isaac, and they were also repeated to, to Jacob and his wider family, including the Rachel and Leah, and also to his 12 sons. So it's worth just having a, a think about that for a minute. What happened to, to Jacob? What happened to Israel? What happened to, to those 12 sons? So Jacob, when he was young, he'd gone up to Haran to, to find a bride. They had then returned. After 20 years, he came back to the land of Israel and settled in the land of Israel. He made up with his brother Esau, who he had left on bad terms with. But then there was a, a famine in the land. In fact, probably the whole land, you know, wider than just the land of Israel, had a, a huge famine, which happens from time to time. Um, actually, I'll just re-skip re that. Before we get to the famine, J the 12 sons, uh, Joseph's brothers, didn't like Joseph. He was kind of favored by God. He was very, very faithful. And so they didn't like him. And he had a number of dreams, which weren't just dreams. They're also prophecies of what was going to happen. So because they didn't like that, they initially put him in a pit, wanted to, to get rid of him, and they ended up selling him to the Ishmaelites. So he was carried off down to Egypt, and at the time they were probably glad they thought they had got rid of him. They pretended to Jacob, his father, that, um, that he had died, and Jacob kind of accepted that. He was you know, sad, really, for the rest of his life until he met Joseph later. So Joseph was taken down into Egypt. You may have heard of um, Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat by Andrew Lloyd Webber. That was a, a, a musical which commemorated those events. So Jacob went into the land of Israel, sorry, into the land of Egypt. Meanwhile, there was a huge famine in the land. This affected Egypt, but also the land of Canaan as well. And over time, a sequence of circumstances Joseph was elevated to be the right-hand man of, of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh was the king, and Joseph was elevated almost to be equal to, to Pharaoh. 
So that famine that affected the land of Egypt also affected Jacob's other sons. And so over time, they were taken down into Egypt. They reconciled with Joseph, and they ended up living in the land of Goshen. So for a while, for several generations, Jacob's sons went down to the land of Egypt. They settled there. They became numerous. They became prosperous until eventually, you know, the generations come and generations go. And another king arose that didn't know Joseph, had forgotten all about the things that Joseph and his brothers had done for the land of Israel. And so over time, those descendants became the, the children of Israel. Moses was the, the, the one that most people think of when you think of the Jewish people. Moses gave the law at Sinai, and the nation of Israel at the time, which is Jacob and his sons and all those sons who had arisen over the next four generations, they were the, the Jews descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Also, the Arab people also descend their ancestry from Abraham, and collectively, Jews and Arabs are known as the, the Semitic people. So the Jews were a whole nation that were established by, well, established through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, going down the generations into Moses. And then God took them out of the land of um, Egypt through a number of miracles that he did, 10, 10 plagues that affected the land of Israel, devast sorry, de uh, against Egypt. Those plagues devastated Egypt, but the, the Jews were taken out of Egypt, and that was a nation that was established by God. I want to look at this quote in particular. You might think, well, why did God choose Israel? Why couldn't he have chosen another nation? You know, the English people or the Scots or the Welsh or the French. Why, why Israel? Why is it? Does that not seem unfair? Well, it's not because the nation of Israel were better than anyone else. They weren't numerically more. They weren't better looking or richer. It was for one reason and one reason only, and that's because as a nation, they were the first nation to really accept God's promises en masse through the whole nation. So God made a covenant with them because of that. If you read this, this passage here from Exodus, the Lord called unto him, that's Moses, out of the mountain, saying, tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. You will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. And all the people answered, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. So God was making a covenant with the children of Israel, partly because of the promises he had made to Abraham, partly because of the promises to Isaac and to Jacob, but also because en masse, that whole nation, at Mount Sinai, having been taken out of the land of Egypt, the whole nation made a covenant with God that they will serve God, and as a result, God made promises to them. So that's something to think about. An entire nation, this is the first time in history where an entire nation promised that they would obey what God did, and as a result, God gave them a law to live by, and he's looked after that people ever since. But again, we're going to look at briefly at some of the history of the children of Israel. And for something like three and a half thousand years, some really unusual and particularly interesting things have happened to that nation. Not only have interesting things happened to them, those things have also been prophesied. So event after event after event that's happened to the children of Israel in a history that's unique among all nations of the earth have been prophesied in the pages of Scripture. And that's for three and a half thousand years. So that shows that there's a God in heaven who can conduct mankind's affairs, who can predict the future and control the future over millennia, not just a few decades or a few years, but can guide mankind over thousands of years. And that's why we know that God will fulfill all the promises that he's talked about in Scripture. Let's just think about that, the, the nation of the Jews, of the people of Israel. First of all, they, they came out of the land of Egypt under those plagues that, we, that we've mentioned. They then wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So they didn't enter the land of Israel in one generation, in that generation. 
the first generation that came out then wandered in the wilderness, and it was the next generation that then um, went into the land of Israel. So under Joshua and Caleb, they were very faithful, and initially things went well. They inherited the land. They fought against the inhabitants of the land. God made them inherit the land. But then over the succeeding generations, there was then the judges of Israel. Israel started to be unfaithful to God, to lose that zeal they had first had when they came out of the land of Egypt. As the generations went on, they had forgotten about the things that God had done for them in the land of Egypt, pulling them out and the miracles he had done. And obeying God as the generations went by just seemed like too much work. And so the nation started to fall away from God, still remembering God, still being part of their history. But God raised up judges who judged the, the, the nation. People could go to the judges for spiritual insights and so on. And those judges conquered Israel's enemy that came against them. But even that wasn't enough. Slowly, Israel started to, to look around at how the nations around them conducted themselves and all the other nations had kings and so on. And so Israel as a nation started to want kings. The first king was Saul. That was a king who the people chose. The people made a choice of who they wanted to be the king. He was taller than everyone else, head and shoulders above everyone. So humanly speaking, he looked like a fantastic person to rule and be, and be king. But it wasn't a good choice. The people chose well or unwell because they couldn't see how Saul thought. So God then chose a king who was King David, and he became an extremely successful ruler. He was very, very faithful and did everything as God wanted. His son was Solomon. And under Solomon's reign, David and Solomon together, Israel was at its peak. It was almost like a kingdom of God on earth where God was the real king. And kings like David and Solomon gave reverence to God and the whole nation tried to sort of come together with priests and also with the kings together to obey God. And then after David and Solomon passed off the scene, there was the divided kingdom where the northern tribes didn't want to, to, to follow Solomon's son, and so they split off. So that happened for, for several years. We'll go through a little bit more of the history shortly until we come to, to the time of Christ. This is the Messiah that was promised to the Jewish people who, who we call Jesus or, or the Christ. So the Jewish people at the time, some of them accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Some did and some didn't. But by and large, they rejected him. On the other hand, the Gentiles did accept Jesus. And so the temple in AD 70, the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed and the priesthood then had no choice but to really disband and stop. And the nation of Israel was then scattered through all the nations of the earth and almost that looked like it would be the end of the Israel as a nation, but they're gathered back in the last hundred years or so, which we'll, which we'll look at. So every single one of those things Every single thing that happened to the, to the Jews or the nation of Israel, every single one, you can look at individual prophecy that says, this is what's going to happen to you, Israel. So that period where they were promised they were going to have a king, that was a, a prophecy in scripture. Being scattered among all the nations was a prophecy in scripture. Being gathered back to their land again after 2,000 years was a prophecy in scripture. And everything that's happened to the children of Israel God has warned them, this is what's going to happen to you down through time. So there's an amazing thing there that God has guided his people down through centuries, over thousands of years. No single person could have predicted this. No single person or sequence of people or families could have made this happen. The amazing events that are happened to the nation of Israel are, are completely unique in history. You could contrast them with other nations, and they are completely and utterly different. So let's just look at a few of the events or the prophecies that talked about Israel being scattered. So from AD 70, really, when the, the Jews were scattered, when the Jerusalem was destroyed and the priesthood was disbanded, 
there was prophecies explaining that this is what will happen. So, for example, I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste, and you be in your enemy's land. So those verses have been fulfilled. For example, you might have heard of Mark Twain, who wrote Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer. So in 1800s, he was a well-known person in America. He, they were interested in the Holy Land back then in 1800s. Mark Twain went to the Holy Land. He was expecting to see, you know, magnificent cities, the city of Jerusalem, all the places he'd read about in the Bible. But when he, when he came, he was incredibly disappointed. He wrote a paper at the time or a, a, a sort of essay that said, you know, where is the land of Israel that we've been told about? It's, it's waste. It's desolate. Their cities are uninhabited. There's malarial swamps. He couldn't understand it. And then yet in about 100, 120, 150 years, that land that was desolate in Mark Twain's time has been completely transformed. The next quote, and they, the Jews, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So Israel has been taken captive several times, as we'll come to see. And Jerusalem has been overrun by the Gentiles. First of all, Hadrian, who we know from Hadrian's Wall in northern England at the top, separating England and Scotland. No one quite knows if the Hadrian's Wall was designed to keep the English in to the Roman Empire or keep the, keep the Scots out. But Hadrian, who helped to build Hadrian's Wall, he ploughed Jerusalem as a field. He destroyed the city. It was already partly destroyed under AD 70, but he completely destroyed as much of the city as he possibly could. He put earth on top of it. He ploughed it flat as a field, and then he rebuilt a Roman city. And ever since then, up until the time when the Jews came back to their land, Israel's really been desolate. It says at the last quote, I will make a full end of all the nations, whether I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee. You would think with all the, the persecution that Jews have had down through the centuries, that by now they would be destroyed. Hitler, for example, wanted to completely, systematically, pathologically wipe out every Jew in the whole of Europe. And yet it was the Nazis who were came to their end in the, in the end, and the Jewish people have kept on going. That wasn't the first attempt to systematically eradicate the Jewish people. Jews have been systematically kicked out of every country at one time or another in Europe. They've been persecuted under the Crusades and Holocaust and other periods of times. And yet those people have come to an end and the Jewish people have continued. That passage about, I will scatter thee. So under the Assyrian Empire, when, when that um, happened, I think 721 was when the, they came against the land of Israel and Israelites were taken captive. So, so the Assyrian Empire took away those 10 northern tribes. tribes, And so Judah and Benjamin were, were left. After that, under the Babylonian exile, the Jews were ported from Judah over to Babylon, where they remained for 70 years. And then after, there was a, another exodus back again. But also under the Roman Empire, Jews were, were taken captive and sold as slaves. So there's been a number of major persecutions of Jews down through the centuries. Entire empires have sought to scatter them. And that's not even talking about the, the Roman Empire, where individual countries in Europe have continued to hound and persecute Jews. But that isn't the end of the story. Again, you would think that after 2,000 years of systematic persecution, systematically kicking them out of countries after the Holocaust, you would imagine finally the Jews would have be finished as a nation. And yet there's another set of prophecies that talk about Jews being gathered back to the land again. After 2,000 years of being scattered, another set of prophecies kicked in that says, at the latter days, at the end of the, the period of time before the Messiah returns, Israel as a nation, all those Jews scattered all throughout the, the world, across all different countries, they will be systematically taken back to the land of Israel 
not just to any land, but specifically to the land of Israel, despite all, all attempts, all logic that you would imagine, how could that possibly happen? So, for example, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob, that's Israel, shall return and none shall make him afraid. Or I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries wherein you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. Or afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. So there's a set of prophecies that explain that Israel, having been scattered across all the countries of the world, will be gathered back in the latter days to none other than the land of Israel. So these events have happened over the last hundred years or so. In 1917, under the Balfour Declaration, there was a, under the United Nations finally agreeing on something for once, they agreed that the Jews could come back to the land of Israel. And in 1948, the state of Israel was formed. So Jews came back to their land, the land of Israel. They spoke Hebrew again, the ancient language that over the last 2,000 years had almost been forgotten. And they established themselves as a nation. None shall make them afraid. So they started to, to fight the surrounding nations. So when the state of Israel was formed, there was seven nations that came against Israel and Israel won. In 1967, the Six-Day War, Israel won again. 1973, Yom Kippur War, Israel won again. And Israel has won battle after battle to establish themselves as a country in the land of Israel. And actually, the nations around slowly under the Abraham Accords are starting to, to make peace with Israel. So they are sitting in the land of Israel and none shall make them afraid. Second quote is God will assemble them out of the countries. So just like you start to assemble something, it takes time to assemble. And the Jews have had numerous times where the one country or another has had an exodus of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. But there's a reason for this is happening. It's, again, interesting, but it's when you understand why God is doing this, why he is working with the children of Israel, and what the implications of that are. That last quote says, afterward, this is after being gathered, shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. So there's a set of prophecies about Israel coming back to their land. And the reason they're coming back to their land is because in the latter days, God is going to once again send back his son, the Lord Jesus, to the Jewish people and actually to the whole world to actively set up God's kingdom. And at that point, the Jewish people will be in the land. Their mindset will start to shift and to realize that actually Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah after all. They will recognize him just as the nations around will also recognize him. So God is gathering the Jews through all the different countries that they've lived in, you know, as far as America, Africa, Asia, all across Europe, they're all being gathered pretty much to the center of the earth, because in ancient maps, Israel was literally in the center of the world, gathering back to the center of the world, to the land of Israel once again, making them speak Hebrew once again, through some incredible events that led up to the state of Israel being formed. And the reason that is happening is because very soon there's another final set of prophecies kicking in, which is that well, God will send his son back again to establish God's kingdom on this earth. And the children of Israel, in the land of Israel, the Jewish people, that nation will understand that this is indeed the Messiah who they had helped to crucify 2,000 years ago with the Romans as well, and also the nations around us. This, this is supposedly a kind of scientific age where people don't believe in, in God, they don't read the scriptures, they don't believe in supernatural events. But that same God who's going to send his son back to, to the Jewish people and to, to make Israel realize that this is their Messiah, that's also the same God who's going to send Jesus back to the nations around us. People will really struggle to understand what's happening. A scientific age that doesn't believe in God, that doesn't believe that miracles can happen, that doesn't believe in supernatural events, 
will realize that God is indeed in control of world affairs and that all these things are happening exactly according to what prophecy would teach. So that the new covenant that God is going to make with Israel, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, which my covenant they break. So that was the, the covenant under Mount Sinai, although I wasn't husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So if you think about those words more closely, the, the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai, we looked at the previous verse where um, the nation of Israel said, yes, you know, everything that you've said, we will obey. They, they did obey, but they also started to break that covenant down through the years. This law is a different law. It says it's not like the old covenant. In other words, with all the rules and regulations and everything prescribed out, it's not like that. This is a law that God is going to put in, in their hearts and their minds and their thinking. There's another chapter, Zechariah chapter 12, that talks about the kind of emotional effect that will happen to the Jewish people when they realize that Jesus of Nazareth was actually God's son, that God sent and they crucified. It talks about all nations separating themselves and, and, and weeping, mourning, understanding that what they've done was absolutely beyond anything you could possibly imagine, actually crucifying God's son, their very Messiah that was sent to save them out of the hand of the Romans and all their enemies, they crucified him. And that is going to be an emotional thing, not a, you know prescribed and commandments and all this. They will have a, an emotional understanding of what they've done. It's a law that they're going to want to obey from that point onwards, just as we also will, will connect with God's Son. So why is this important? Why have, we, why have we looked at the nation of Israel? Well, possibly for two reasons. One is because it is interesting but it also does two other things. One is that you can see through the arc of time, through 4,000 years, remember Abraham was about 4,000 years ago, Moses 3,500 years ago, David 3,000 years ago, the Babylonian exile 2,500 years ago, Jesus 2,000 years ago, Israel scattered through the nation over the last 2,000 years, and just in the last hundred years, Israel gathered back again. So God is in control of world affairs. Mankind thinks he's in control. Maybe we can control things for a few years or whenever a politician is in power, but probably not. But God is overruling the affairs of man. He can control the destiny of entire nations over thousands of years. Remember, all of these things are prophesied in Scripture. So on the one hand, the nation of Israel and understanding what's happened to them shows God's hand in world history. There's no other nation that's got anything close to the history that Israel has and the very unique things that happened to them. So all of that is prophesied. So that and that alone should convince you that there's a God in heaven ruling over mankind. In Isaiah, it says, you are my witnesses, Israel. If you want to prove that God exists, just look at the nation of Israel. So that's one important factor why Israel is important. But the other major reason is that when these things happen, it's a sign that God is very shortly going to intervene in world affairs and actively set up his kingdom. There's the signs of the times that we talk about. There are many signs of when it will be that God will intervene in world affairs, actively send his son back, and set up that kingdom on earth. And the really, really big sign of that is when the Jews come back to their land, that will prove to you that God, God's kingdom is nigh. Even as much as 400 years ago, Isaac Newton, the, the famous scientist, used to be a, a Bible scholar. He read the Bible carefully. And he was one of the people that said, you know, if you look at the nation of Israel, when they return back to their land, that will be a sign that God's kingdom is about to, to take place. 
So for hundreds of years after he, he wrote that, nothing happened. You know, Jews were still persecuted. The Holocaust happened. And yet in our day, just over the last few decades, less than 100 years, God has seen that his kingdom will start to be set up and Jews start to come back to their land. So the other major reason is that when, the, when we see these things happen, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he will then appear in his glory and the kingdom will start to be set up. This is also prophesied in the New Testament. The same Jesus whom you see going up into heaven shall so come in like manner. So time and time again in the New Testament, it also talks about Jesus returning. But these things are part of the signs of the times. The Israelites coming back to their land, speaking Hebrew again, as they always did, and starting to be open to the possibility of the Messiah returning before the world comes against Israel to try and destroy it for a final time. All of these things are prophesied in the major events of the signs of the times. And there's many other signs of the times, completely and utterly independent of, of Israel. The way that men's hearts are, people are becoming afraid, you know, mental health difficulties, people afraid of what's happening in the world. That's one of the signs of the, the end of the age where God will intervene and send his son back. The way nations are aligning, all the nations of Europe and Russia, all of these things are prophesied in scripture. The way that Britain and America and Australia are starting to, to come together as a distinct body is, again, a prophecy in Scripture. The whole thing that happened with Israel gathering, gathering back to the land again has been prophesied in Scripture. Things like earthquakes and disease is one of the last signs of the, the coming age. So we could have a whole talk about the signs of the times, and we, we frequently do have talks about the signs of the times. But all of these things point to Jesus of Nazareth, God's anointed, God's son, returning back to this earth to establish his people. And Jew and Gentile will be, will be part of that. So I want you to think about this. Uh, do genuinely think about this. At the start, I said that you know, we've had four, uh, sorry, eight webinars. Roughly speaking, four of them may have seemed interesting, theoretical, you know, learning about the Bible and the books of the Bible and translations and study tools. Maybe it seems a little bit theoretical, but it's when you start to look at these things that this message becomes personal. God genuinely wants every single person to, to believe in him. He's given us examples of the kind of thing that will happen to you if you do believe in him. The promises to Adam, the promises to Noah, the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those promises can be ours you know, if we show the same faith as Abraham did, if we turn to the scriptures, if we believe in God, if we genuinely want to serve God and to find out what God wants from us, God will welcome us in the same way as he did with faithful Abraham. So don't think of this as being theoretical, you know, very interesting eight webinars. Really think of this as a personal message to you individually. If you're listening online or you're in the hall, this is a a really genuinely personal message that you must respond to to God calling us to, to to understand the Bible and to respond to him. God wants us to to read the scriptures. He wants us to be in that kingdom. And just as Abraham chose to obey God and Isaac chose to obey God and Jacob and his sons chose to obey God, we also have a choice to make. Either you can just ignore this and go your way and just think it was interesting, but you know there's something else happening in your life, or you can choose to obey God, choose to read the scriptures and understand what God wants from you. Otherwise, other, because the, the word gospel means good news, this is genuinely good news about how you can be saved in God's kingdom. So that's really the end of the, this webinar. I'm open to questions in a, in a few moments, but I want you to maybe think about what the next steps could be, could be for you or could be in general. First of all, we've got a number of booklets out the back. You're free to take any of these away. There's one here that might be interesting. It's the, the kingdom of God on earth, God's plan for the world. 
So if you want to think more about that coming kingdom, the idea that God is going to send his son back to establish the kingdom and that Jew and Gentile will be part of that, you know, you individually could be a part of it. That booklet will also give you some food for thought. We've got other um, leaflets or pamphlets on the miracle of the Bible, on Israel as a nation. And there's many other leaflets, so you're free to, to take those away and really think about them. We also have an email address. So again, if you want to ask more and ask when maybe the next webinars or Bible classes and so on are, then you're free to email us. We've also got a website, and the website's good for just um, looking at what's happening, what we're doing in Mumbles, when the next Bible classes are, when different talks are, and so on. You can also find a lot of our Bible talks and Bible addresses on YouTube as well. But we do have another set of seminars coming in early 2023, and that looks at the, the Acts of the Apostles. So if you think about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are all about what Jesus did, how people responded to him at the time, and how he was eventually crucified. But the next half of the story is all about what happened after that. The Acts of the Apostles, Jesus had named a number of apostles, and they were sent out to preach the Gospels to the whole world, not just to the land of Israel, but to, to everywhere. So Acts and the letters of Paul explains what happened after the death of Jesus. If you think about uh, a series on television, the Gospels might be episode one, and episode two is then what happened after that. You might think of what would episode three be. Well, episode three might well be the book of Revelation, where for the last 2,000 years, everything that's happened religiously and politically has been unfolding prophecy down through the last 2,000 years. So this is a really good follow-on uh, webinar from, from us. We'll be doing it here and happening in early 2023. Um, so that's the end of this webinar.